Today on The Big Questions, closing down hospitals, prenuptial agreements and moral tales. Good morning, I'm Nicky Campbell. Welcome to The Big Questions. Today we're live from Jack Hunt School in Peterborough. Welcome everybody to The Big Questions. <laughs> now, on Monday week, Parliament will be asked to vote on whether the Secretary of State for Health should have the power to close hospitals in England, even if the staff and local communities are opposed to it. It's a matter of keen interest here in Peterborough, where the local hospital is in deep financial trouble. Has the time come to phase out local hospitals? Uh, welcome to Professor Terence Stevenson, Chair of the Academy of Medical Royal <coughs> Colleges. It's great to have you here. How on earth is phasing out local hospitals putting patients first? It's always couched as hospital closure, but it's hardly ever that. What the people in this audience want is the right treatment in the right place at the right time. I've spent the last week from dawn to dusk looking after emergencies. And what's preventing doctors like me giving people like this the best quality care they can is the fact that we're trying to run 20th century hospitals in 21st century medicine. So there's two things we're struggling with, just two things, two, mm -hmm. two things. One is that all the evidence from strokes, trauma, cancer, heart attacks, is if anyone in this room now is ill, the best chance of surviving that illness is to be treated somewhere where we do lots of it. And the second reason... Expertise. Expertise. Yeah. You know that. If you have a MFI flat pack, you build a couple of them a year, they don't fit together, the drawers don't come out. If you're doing 7, 10 a day, you get very good at it. We're not talking furniture, we're talking people. Everybody, same principle. The more you do, the better you get. That's common sense. Second point is that on this Sunday morning, there will be 220 hospitals in the United Kingdom available and open for children's emergencies. About half of those 110 in the next 24 hours will only admit six or seven children. And half of those, 50 of those hospitals, will be less than 30 minutes' drive from another hospital admitting seven children. Both of them need to be fully staffed, and currently we can't staff them. They'll be 30% short of accident emergency consultants, 30% short of paediatricians, short of children's nurses. So we can't staff them, and we need to have the volume, the, the expertise... So for goes... some people it will be a longer journey? For some people, it will be a 30-minute journey. Yeah, yeah. Does this make sense, Clive Peedle? Well, I think you've timed this debate very well, because only in the last week in the BMJ, uh, the British Medical Journal, there was a publication that showed that actually the number of hospitals we have compared to other countries in the OECD is extremely low. Uh, so we've got too few hospitals al already in this country. We've already seen the number of beds cut from... Uh, 300,000 to just under 150,000 in, in the last 20 years. Now, some of that is due to changes that need to happen, uh, but we've got bed occupancy rates of 90% plus uh, when the, the, the safe level is around uh, 85%. So, clinically, this could be very dangerous. And I'll come back to your specific point about heart attacks and strokes. I agree with Professor Stevenson. There's clear evidence that centralising some services can improve survival. What those studies don't actually show is what actually happens to all the other conditions. If you close your local hospital, what happens to the uh, acute asthmatic that has to travel a lot further? Uh, what happens to the choking child? What happens to all the other medical emergencies? That data doesn't look at that. Uh, it doesn't look at what happens to changing local health. So this could be economies. dangerous? This is dangerous. And, and what we've seen uh, is, is austerity that's happening at the moment. Uh, there's going to be a £50 billion pound uh, funding gap by 2020 for the NHS. So this is not about clinical decisions, this is about finance. And, and there's clear evidence now that actually if you increase healthcare spending and education, this is from the IMF, from Oxford University, mm -hmm. from Stanford University, if you increase spending, actually it stimulates economic growth, not, not have a negative effect, because you keep your health, population healthier. So uh, we need to go completely against the austerity agenda, which is damaging our health more of the population. More so it's damaging the health the population, and we're decreasing the number of services, which is going to lead to increasing privatisation and, uh, you know, medical insurance, which we're going towards. It's outrageous. Outrageous. <laughs> Julia Manning, this is outrageous, but you believe that uh, keeping a lot of local hospitals open, uh, they're not safe. You believe they're not safe, don't you? 
Uh, absolutely. Believe they're not safe. And this is not about cutting services. This is about changing the way we deliver services so they're fit for this generation and the next generation. We still have the old model of lots of hospital services, people going to hospitals, even though most of, most of us know that when you go to hospital, you're not in there for, you know, when you have an operation, be in there for a week or two. A lot of surgery is now day surgery. We need to be using what we have in terms of resources and our people in a much more intelligent way so that we can actually meet the needs of the current population. We are meeting the needs growing. of the population if they have to travel further to visit their relatives in hospital and the relatives know that they might not be getting at visits as frequently. You know, that's got, that's got to be bad for anyone who's recovering in hospital. That, that, and that might be a, a consequence of this. Well, we need to remember that the majority of healthcare takes place in the community already. And that is where the most patient professional contacts take place. It's in primary care in the community. Hospitals are only a small part of the NHS, but we seem to have a national hospital service instead of a national health service. We need to make it fit for purpose for this century. We're not using technology in the way that we should. It is nonsense that I should have to visit, uh, had to go to a hospital to see a consultant, to have a conversation, I could have on the phone, they then tell me that I need to have tests and come back for them. Tests that I could have in my GP surgery. I mean, the, the, the time wasted, we're not using technology in the way that we should, whether that's you know, the phone, Skype. I mean, we, we hear these arguments and actually the evidence base, apart from, from a few selective conditions, is by, by the advocate's own admission weak. And I think we need to have these sort of discussions on a case-by-case -case basis. You know, the public is frankly not convinced that we, you know, I personally am sick of being patronised by experts who tell me that it, it's better for my health to close my local hospital. You know, and I think that we need to be able to be having those discussions in our local community. We were told in the Act no decision about me without me, after all. Mm. And yet what they're trying to build, bring in with this legislation is a fast-track... So you th do you think this procedure. is circumventing local democracy? Abs it explicitly, yeah. it allows no more than 40 days. I mean, as a, someone who's campaigned against hospital privatisation, 40 days is no time to mobilise and save your local hospital. Let's, get, get, let's, let's look at the evidence in a second. I want to hear from people in the audience. OK, I'll do that in a second. Let's look at the evidence. These, these big centres of, of excellence, is there concrete statistical evidence that they save lives. Julia Manning. When they're specialist centres, yes, as Professor Stevenson said, absolutely, you want to go to a specialist centre. Now, if I had a... And a, lives have been saved. Absolutely. If I had a rare UV or tumour in my eye, I would want to go nowhere else than the Royal Liverpool Hospital because that is where they specialise. There is no expertise in the world better than that. I will take a train to go for that. But we not, must remember the bigger picture. We have a £30 billion funding gap in the next eight years, and that's just for keeping <clears> services as they are. And the, where do we get that money from? We either take it from other services, from education, do we really want to do that, from our communities, or we raise taxes. But to raise taxes, to raise that money, you're looking at it on the average salary, an extra £100 tax a month. So, and it's, it's going to get a lot worse as the yeah. population gets older as well. And part of the problem here, Clive, with, this, with this ma these monster mortgages that the hospitals yeah. have as a result of the yeah. private finance yeah. initiative, yeah. I, mean, I mean, they are just... Frightening mortgages. We, we're, talk, we're talking about funding. And they were the, sorry. The, the they, were, they were set in, in, in sunnier times, so you know they're yeah. paying back at a, at a rate of interest they would never be paying back if they were set now. Absolutely. Look, Julia's right about specialist centres, but we need we need both. You need your specialist centres and you need your smaller hospitals as well. I'm a cancer specialist. I work in a specialist <laughs> hospital, but I also do peripheral clinics in my local hospitals so that I can deliver a radiotherapy service to the to the wider community. But you can't afford to have. The, the equipment in every hospital, it's, extreme, it's extremely uh, costly and you need a lot of expertise, so you, so you need both. Uh, actually, we need, we need more funding of the health service and people are saying, well, where are you going to get it from? Well, we're wasting billions of pounds on a, on a healthcare market. So we've got this purchaser provider split with GPs buying care off hospitals. We've got a market, patients becoming consumers of healthcare. That just drives up costs. It's, it's, it's wasting £10 billion a year. We've also nationally got huge tax avoidance problems, £70 billion a year in tax avoidance. We need HMRC to stop concentrating on the small people, focus on the big people. There are thousands of people... So there's huge problems, and we need to understand Professor the arguments Pro about funding. Professor, Te Professor funding Stevenson... stimulates economic growth. Get your hands ready, I'll be coming around the audience. I know this is a, a live and important issue locally. Professor Stevenson... Clamping down on tax avoidance, uh, is that ever going to be enough to pay for what we need in the future going ahead with this ageing population? 
It's not about paying. I started from it's about giving the people the best quality care they can, we can give. We lag behind countries like Sweden, Norway. If you visit those countries, people recognise that the best quality care is not delivered by having 220 hospitals. They have far higher but tax rates. Yeah. They have, there are other differences. But right now, I worked in a centre for 22 years where we had no local uh, children's heart surgery. For much of that time, we didn't have adult heart surgery either. I never, ever, ever heard a patient or a relative say, uh, I don't want to go by aeroplane to Glasgow or Newcastle. Every <coughs> single time they said, I want to go where I can get the best treatment possible and the best chance of surviving. <laughs> Uh, yes, sir. We've got the, mic the microphone down. A very good morning. Good Quick morning. points, so we'll get through you. I think we have to see this uh, uh, <coughs> economy as a whole because uh, already this public-private partnership and you know this privatisation of hospitals is going on. We have to see, uh, and there is an argument here that there is no money here. There is a funding gap. I mean, there is money in the economy here. I mean, just take an example of this: all big banks which are taking all bailouts from the government. Uh, just last year, Royal Bank of uh, Scotland (RBS) had. 146 billion in their profit, and just 9 billion they pay out in uh, in in uh, you know the bonuses of big, of their all executives. I mean that's what is going on in all this economy. And why don't this money? Why can't this money can be thrown into health services and all these uh, to fund hospitals? We'll get onto that in a minute. Any other any other points? Yeah, you sir. Go on. Here. Yeah. I mean, if you were really ill and if I had cancer, we've got a great new district hospital in Peterborough. It's in financial problems, mainly because of Labour's failed private finance initiative. But if you had cancer in this part of the world, you'd want to go to Addenbrooke's in Cambridge, which is a teaching hospital. Well, is that, well, we'll ask uh, the Professor about that in a second. Moving along, you, sir. Yes, I mean, I, I, think, I think we have to look at really what's, the, what's driving um, the, the proposed clause to the, to the care bill. Um, and that was sort of brought in by, uh, or Jeremy Hunt's tried to insert this, this clause in order to give him unprecedented powers to close local hospitals. It's because of the situation in Lewisham. And that was in, yeah. the, wake of, yeah, that was in the wake of the Lewisham decision, mm. where he was deemed to have, uh, have acted beyond, uh, be, beyond his powers. But what we're seeing with, with the closures, uh, are a, lot, a lot of the closures are closures of things like accident and emergency services. Now, just to give an example, of, of the consequences of that. In, in Chase Farm, in, in hospital in London, they closed the accident and emergency service, uh, service there. Um, weeks later, a mother rushed her young child um, over to Chase Farm, not realising that the accident and emergency service had closed, um, and as a consequence of that, had to rush around and try and find another, another hospital, which was the increased travel distance. And yeah, there, there was a very tragic incident where that, where that child um, very, very sadly OK, just to put that point, died. is that a trade union badge, by the way? It, it's, it's, it is, yes, yeah, so you is, obviously is, something is. You, 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 would, you, would, you would know about. Situate, we don't know the individual situation there, Julian Manning, but are, are, other, are, these, inevit are these inevitable consequences of that, closures? That's yeah. a, a, I know, that's a tragic, tragic story, and our heart goes out, obviously, to that. But mother. are stories but like that the inevitable a, consequence? A, that is a failure of, of publicity and telling the public what's going on with our health services. Mm. And this is why this debate is so important, because the public needs to realise not only do we have a £30 billion funding gap over the next eight years, that doesn't take into account the rising incidence of diabetes, of dementia, of sight loss. We've got to fund that as well. We cannot go on funding so many buildings you know, and, and pouring money into them. We need to put the money into people and into services. And it's not about closure. It is about transferring and changing. But, I mean, what we're, we're continually told, you know, that, that our suspicions are wrong. I mean, we were told here in Peterborough that the, P, the, the private finance initiative scheme uh, wasn't unaffordable and that that was conspiracy talk. And then, we, you know, we're told a few years later that it was an absolute catastrophe and that the only answer is to sell it off and, and privatise it. And I think, you know, our fears are, are grounded and they need to be heard. I mean, in where I live, there's a, a district general hospital people have fought very hard to save. Uh, we're now being told that, you know, those services, it's not the best place, you know, the kind of points you're making, and that we'll have uh, community-based care. Uh, in much the same way that we were told 20 years ago about mental health care and care in the community, those services simply aren't there. District nurses' numbers that are supposed to be picking up the pieces when all these little hospitals close down, and it is about closure, Julia. We've lost many, we're losing a lot of beds at the moment. 
And these district nurses that are p supposed to be picking up the pieces, their figures have declined 40% in the last 10 Julia years. Yeah. Yeah. We need to change Fashionable. the way we train nurses. We still train nurses and doctors in hospitals when the ma you know, majority of care needs to take place in the community. So in, London, they trained, in London, they trained five district nurses only in the last year. And this is supposedly the so people why, home. So why are we not looking fundamentally at the way that, not just we, the way the public use services, but the way we plan them, the way we train staff, we need to make it fit for the next... And generation. I, I don't so think my daughter has got the certainty of being able to have her children on the NHS in a place which is safe and secure where she's going to get the best possible outcomes. That's not going to happen if we don't fundamentally change You've the way that we it. deliver it's the majority of services. Is there, evidence? Is, there, is there evidence that you said there, there was, as there, we were discussing, there's, there's, that people are dying because of well, closure? There, there, there is evidence from Newark Hospital. That was that the A&E closed uh, a couple of years ago. It's subject to an ongoing investigation. But uh, the, the, the mortality rate of uh, people within that region, emergency admissions, has gone up by about 30%. And now that needs to be looked at to, to confirm. But that, that's just an example. So, because people have to travel much further. The, the, the ambulance time, the ambulance journeys are going a lot on. Julia, we fundamentally agree about a lot of things, but it has to come with, with, with the funding. And this government is, is, is clear. There's a clear agenda to cut the amount of public spending right across the board, not just for health services, but right across the board. Because we don't and, have and, the money. And you can't do that. And so privatisation <laughs> is inevitable. A mixed funding system, so health insurance is coming our way. And I'm, I'm so okay. angry about this. I've actually co-founded a, a political party, the National Health Action Party. Who are you standing against? Stand, I am, this is a formal announcement today, I'm going to stand against David Cameron in Whitney uh, on an NHS ticket uh, for the 2015 general election. Uh, and the people of Whitney will have the opportunity to, you know, to keep the NHS they want to. Because if we carry on as the way we are, we're going to lose our National Health Service. Professor no Stevenson, we've, we, it's something, we've debated uh, the privatisation issue before right here on The Big Questions. <laughs> Professor Stevenson, this leads us to the conclusion that we've heard from Clive. We are losing our National Health Service, are we? No, it's not about privatisation, nor is it about hospital closure. Peterborough is a city with 184,000 people. It's about 39 miles from Cambridge. It's not much further from Leicester, two huge centres. If you have a condition that can be treated at home, best place is for it to be treated at home. If you have a condition that allows you to be treated in Peterborough, sure, best to stay in Peterborough. If you have something complex that needs more technical expertise, better you go to some centre where they do lots of it. It's not either or, and it's feeding the public, it's, it's misleading the public. There's hardly any example in the country where hospitals close and there's nothing. Mm -hmm. They move to a service where you have immediate urgent care, and if you're seen in a category that needs help, paramedics transfer you to someone that can deliver you It's a you difficult sell, though. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's quite it a is a difficult sell, and politicians <laughs> can't do it. Because the MPs aren't going to stand up in the constituency. The MPs would be the first to say local it will cost them 10,000 votes in yeah. every single... They know that. that that's and Keane's you, you, been on... When someone presents with an illness, you don't know how ill they are until they've been assessed. Someone comes in with a headache. It could be meningitis. It could just be a, could be a migraine. So they need if to see to an, an expert care center, to be assessed. You know, where they've lost their local ID. They would have had an ITU. They no longer got an ITU. They got an hour down the road. Wait, Professor. They need to be seen and assessed by expert medical and nursing staff, and having done that, they need to be triaged. Do they stay? Stay and play, swoop and scoop. You know, that is the modern 21st century healthcare. It's not about everybody doing everything but, in an immediate way. And whilst we've been hearing about individual examples, and they are tragedies, let's not be complacent about the fact that right now, today, the outcomes, survival of people in this country is worse than France, worse than Germany, worse than Holland, worse than many comparable countries. We want to get up to that standard of care. We won't do that by dwelling on, on one person. They've spent billions of pounds more than the NHS. If we were starting again, Clive Peter, decades. If, we, if, we were start, decades. if we were starting again, um, <laughs> decades, <laughs> if, we were start, really? yeah, if we were starting again with a blank sheet of paper, wouldn't we, you, be designing a National Health Service rather like the vision that the Professor has. Uh, Julia Manning's agreeing. I thought she rather would. Well, you should but, say you know, we've got, we've got, we've local, got a, local we've, health centres dealing with The National Health Action problems? Party's got a 12-point plan. Right. Go, go, go and look at it. It's a publicly funded, publicly provided and publicly Rather than your 12-point plan, which we'll, be read, which we'll be reading about, and I'm sure David Cameron will be going plan, up with a fine tooth comb. system, Nikki. Well, ca ca um, Caroline, we'd we'll be starting with a, what, what, me what, medical centres and, and big centres of expertise as no well, wouldn't we? No one's arguing for nothing to change, but I mean, I think it would be important to remember in 2010, you know, there were independent studies by the Commonwealth Fund by the OECD, the NHS, in terms of pounds spent per life saved, and, and I see Terence nodding and Julia, is what was one of the most efficient systems in the whole world. Yeah. You know, we hear...
and, and that's why that's why people are so proud of it in this yeah. country. And, and you know, we hear about uh, the sort of new technologies that can come in, and we can have this different sort of more effective system. I mean, we only have to. We, we heard this message about the 111 service, which has been. And I hear people laughing. You know, that's in a classic example. Technology was rolled out. Oh, you don't need to go and clog up hospitals and block beds. Just call this number. But that's it an, an example of promises that didn't materialise. And, and that was not to do with the technology. Okay, last, 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 last words from the audience. Uh, and Terence, I'll give you the last word in a second, if I may call you Terence rather than Professor. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, a quick, quick comment, if you would. Um, That's you. On the terms of saying that these are tragic stories and they are really sad and they can't be helped and we should not be focused on too much, if I hadn't got to hospital within three minutes of when I had an anaphylactic shock, I wouldn't be in this seat. So you can't just ignore the tragic stories. No, why not? If I couldn't get to a sh hospital if I had an anaphylactic shock now and my next hospital was too far away, I wouldn't survive and that's the reality. What? What's your name? Ruth. Ruth. Ruth's situation. Yeah. She might not be here today in our audience. OK. Yeah, so, this is the final word. Final word. I've worked in the NHS all my life. I've never seen a private patient, despite being frequently asked because of my expertise. See, I, I, believe, we should, I believe in the NHS free at the point of delivery. Mm -hmm. What I'm asking for is an NHS that can deliver 21st century care comparable to other countries. And for you, for three Ruth. minutes, you want the paramedic to come to your home if you're that ill mm -hmm. and get there yeah. within three minutes. Don't be relying on you getting somewhere else. Mm -hmm. That is the, the modern world is that the medicine comes to you, triage and takes you to the facility that can best deliver high quality care that hopefully will get you to survive and go home. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you.